All right, so um, I had this comment to be posted on one of my videos, the series announcement for what happens when, um, posted by Sese, 1856. Uh, and um, he has a few questions here. Um, and I wanted to actually make a video about this, you know, answering this question, right? Uh, with a few kind of parentheses here and there, right? Because we're not going to be able to actually answer the question that Sese is asking 100% and so on and there's there are two questions actually um so let's get one thing kind of out of the, out of the way from the beginning uh what feature, features that exist in other languages that would not detract from simplicity or readability or debugging is would you like to see in odin that is close but not quite the grail language that reaches perfection for you personally um uh, i don't know is the quick answer to this question um most of the features that i actually see in other languages and so on, and I've used a, a ton of languages. Uh, most of them would not really fit in Odin. Um, Odin is, is basically fundamentally different than most uh, languages, I would say. If we're talking about things outside of the language, that there are certain things that I would definitely want to see in Odin um, that would make the experience better. Um, one of them would be cross-compilation and cross-linking without any issue. Uh, making things for Windows should be just as simple as just running, you know, the compiler with certain directives and that's it, right? This is an experience you can get with Zig currently and so on. Um, I think for Linux to feel like it's maybe a little bit more supported would feel good in Odin as well. Um, but yeah, primarily cross-compilation, I would say, for that to be completely fixed, the entire pipeline. That means compilation, linking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to be able to do things without the standard library uh, in general, just if you're using syscalls and so on, using uh, muscle, libc, for example. Uh, I don't know exactly how doable this is right now, but I get the feeling that it's not particularly. Um, and this is an experience that also is completely almost seamless in, in Zig. Um, this is something I would definitely want. And um, compiling with muscle libc basically makes it so that you can actually distribute binaries without even worrying about libc at all. You can statically compile libc into your binaries. And this is a great boon to distribution. So that's that sort of taken care of. In terms of features, I'm not gonna really, there's nothing that stands out, uh, to be honest. And that doesn't mean that Odin is perfect. Uh, it means that I, I haven't stumbled upon anything that would be like, oh, I really want this one thing. Um, we can get the kind of obvious stuff out of the way. Some people want macros and interesting meta program facilities in Odin. I don't, I don't want that. Um, in fact, I am against that, right? for Odin. So um, I'm very happy Odin does not have those things. Um, so that's that part of the question kind of, you know, um, not answered necessarily, but you know, this is the best answer I have right now. And uh, so the other question is, um, what languages did you give a proper try writing non-trivial applications to evaluate how well features interact? Um, this question is a little bit uh, kind of loaded, right? Um, there's a lot there. Um, I think you may or may not be a little bit naive um, about this proper try writing non-trivial applications. Uh, no one's doing this. Um, if, if that's what you're expecting from people's evaluations, I have bad news. Um, most of them are very trivial. Um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It is completely unrealistic to expect to make applications in every language just to see how well stuff works out. You have to do educated guessing at the end of the day. Um, you have to look at track records of features, types of languages, and so on. I know for a fact that Java and Java-like languages are not going to be relevant to me. Um, 
and by Java and Java-like languages, I mean everything is a class and so on and so forth. Everything is basically heap allocated unless there's magic going on and stuff like this, right? So, you know, those languages don't even make sense to evaluate. But there are way too many languages out there for you to evaluate them based on doing projects. And if you can do a project in every language, you have definitely done something trivial. Um, I would consider non-trivial to be something that you actually have to put in considerable effort over, you know, at least, you know, a month or two. And no one has that time. Uh, no one has that time and energy, and it is a fool's errand at the end of the day, right? So don't evaluate languages like that at all. Um, try them uh, one at a time, maybe. And consider the fact that you will not, you will not be actually diving that deep into most of them at all. Um, with that said, um, here are 10 languages that I have at some point evaluated before Odin. So the criteria for which, uh, with which I'm kind of judging these languages, um, I should I should say it, it's very specific, right? So oh, it's not specific, but it, it is in some ways kind of unique. Uh, I'm not sure that a lot of people will sort of agree with these criteria, right? But I'm going to state them up front so we know kind of what we're dealing with. I, I'm fully expecting to write 95, 95 plus percent of the code in, in my projects, um, as in, that is to say, um, I don't expect to rely on libraries a lot, right? The projects that I want to do uh, are not best served by just installing a bunch of libraries, right? And this is, will come into, into play with certain, certain languages on this list and so on. Uh, you might find that some of these upsides that they have uh, simply aren't super relevant and so on. Um, so I just want to be clear about this, right? Lots of code will be essentially just mine. The idea is also to have code that lives for a long time, uh, have code that I rely on for my project for a long, long time. This is inspired by uh, a guy called called Eskil Stienberg. And so Eskil has this uh, video, Modern C Development, uh, hang on, this is not it. How I program C, this one. So. If you watch this video, it's excellent. Uh, these two hours and 11 minutes go by very fast. Um, and so this video details effectively how Eskil has built um, a tower of C. Um, and that's not to say that this is somehow a massive blob of things. It's rather that Eskil has built effectively a his own standard library to some extent for higher level things, for things that he wants to do. We're talking uh, rendering, network programming, and so on. And so a lot of what he's done is effectively build the things that you kind of associate to some degree with higher level languages. Right? A lot of stuff really comes down to libraries and the ability to create them and use them reliably, right? And this is the creating and using that where C kind of, in some respects, falls apart. Uh, people won't agree on exactly how to use certain things and so on. But you often find that there are very sensible C libraries that can be used very easily and so on. And they actually feel a lot like just using libraries from other languages. Uh, it's not really not that big a deal, right? Uh, they don't require you to do very much to use them and so on. And they're very good. And so the key to some of these things is simply building up your mountain of code, right? That mountain will then be useful for you. Uh, in some ways, you will be building something you can stand atop and look out and potentially reach new heights from, right? And because you're using certain languages, you will build something that's foundational, right? You can actually build atop it, right? Because you have control. It fits in with code that's simply just other native code. It doesn't mandate a runtime of any sort and so on, right? So it is with some of those kinds of angles that we're looking at this, right? Uh, 
By the way, uh, I really rec recommend this video, How I Program C by Eskil Stienberg. Just, uh, you should definitely watch it. It's a good, uh, it's a good watch, very impressive. Um, but also details, you know, why does Eskil actually think that C89 is the way to go for him, right? What is it that makes that happen? And you might be inspired to actually say, hey, I also want to do this, right? Uh, but yeah, so those are some of the things that we're kind of looking at in some of these scenarios, right? Um, we're not looking at it from, hey, can I make a, just a normal uh, run-of-the-mill backend CRUD service or whatever, right, tomorrow. Because if that's actually what we're talking about, you know, some of these languages on the list will be actually maybe the better choice, right? But we're actually looking for something that actually can be of higher quality, more interesting, much more demanding, and yeah, a little bit just, yeah, more interesting than just a CRUD service, right? So let's move on to the actual candidates. So I'm going to do this list from basically most obvious to least obvious. Um, there are other languages that I have at some point looked at, evaluated, written something in, uh, and so on. But um, we're only going to do 10. And these are in some order, but the ordering is not super 100% uh, necessarily perfect. perfect right? So um, I'm starting with most obvious alternatives to Odin to least obvious. Right? Um, one of these is, of course, Zig. Um, I've mentioned this uh, previously. I used to write Zig. I used to be basically all in on Zig. Um, and I still think Zig is amazing, just to be clear. Right? Uh, Zig is basically, if Odin did not exist, I would be using Zig right now, for sure. Right? The, there's only one bad thing I can say about Zig. Right? the error handling is just worse than in Odin. Uh, the, rest are, the rest is just details that I think are slightly better in Odin. That is it. If someone were to tell me, you know, Zig is... I'm going to go with Zig. I would be like, yeah, fair enough, to be honest, right? I don't think it's a bad choice. It leads to readable software. Uh, they are solving the right problems. You have you know, table stakes for actually having something that makes sense, uh, like custom allocators. Allocators are, you know, you can pass them around, you can, uh, you know, use them to great effect. Uh, it is a fairly obvious language in that it doesn't do stuff unless you asked for it. So there's no hidden control flow, no hidden memory allocations, uh, no pre preprocessor, no macros, right? The only thing you have kind of like macros in Zig is basically comp time, and that is just code that runs at compile time uh, and so on. And that is much, much more obvious and much more debuggable than any meta programming that I have used. I also mentioned in the live stream that in Zig, you can actually get something quite like OCaml functors uh, by just returning. In some ways, that is actually kind of what the types are when you have a type parameterized on another type and so on. And um, it is a, a delightful language. So if you don't 100% feel like, oh, well, yeah, I'm 100% on Odin, um, give Zig a try. It might gel better with you, right? Granted, a lot of the principles behind Odin and Zig are the same. That is why I like them. Um, they are definitely my kinds of languages, right? So, yeah, the tooling... Um, with regards to cross compilation and stuff like this is absolutely excellent in Zig. Uh, you can compile very easily for things like uh, WASM. Uh, you can compile for other architectures, uh, operating systems, and so on. Um, it is an excellent experience in that respect. So Zig, that is the number one alternative. I should also mention uh, I used to sponsor Zig. Uh, I did Zig from 2019 until about 2022 at some point. Was away a little bit and then sort of rediscovered some stuff with Odin. 
and decided, hey, this is actually better than Zig. I'm going to start doing that, right? Um, so this here from 2019, July 12th, is actually um, Zig did not have donations before that, as far as I know. Uh, so I was sponsoring Andrew Kelly, and actually GitHub was nice enough to match this 50. So the donation was actually a total of $100 per month, uh, which I hope he got something out of. Um, Andrew Kelly is worth investing in, to be honest. Um, now, though, we're obviously doing Odin, uh, trying to put money there, uh, see if that does something. Uh, so here's my one of my first projects in Zig. Uh, it was a an application for showing uh, disk info in uh, Windows. So just drawing a window uh, that shows how many gigs of uh, space I have left and so on. Very simple, very nice, uh, just sort of fun to do as a first project. Uh, here it says this was my second project. I don't remember what the first one was, to be honest. Um, yeah. Uh, I also used to maintain, um, let's see here. Oh, wow. I also used to maintain Win32. This is now public archive. Um, and this was basically auto-generated and then tweaked uh, Win32 code for using Win32 stuff from Zig and so on, with which, um, yeah, you could do Win32 stuff. Nowadays, you should use this library instead, Zig Win32, um, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how good this is. I haven't used it. I'm recommending it because it's the most obvious alternative. This is now nowadays a public archive, right? So that's Zig, uh, fantastic language. You, you know, you can't go wrong with Zig. Uh, it's mostly that, you know, Odin is just slightly better at certain things. The error handling is distinctly very better. Other stuff, I think it's just better. I believe more in it. Um, I think it has a nicer. Uh, the, the code becomes slightly nicer without any cost, basically, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, Zig is fantastic. Um, I really recommend looking into it. All right, so number two on the list, a fairly obvious uh, alternative to most people who kind of have some, uh, they're in the know, so to speak, Rust. Just full disclosure, don't like it. Uh, it's at number two mostly because, well, it is obvious to most people that this would be an alternative, right? Nowadays, it is obviously very quote unquote hip or whatever. Uh, I have three times, three different times, I would say, kind of not tried to get into that would be disingenuous, but you know, written stuff in Rust to see, you know, is it different? Do I feel different about it? Uh, and so on. Um, I was very into Rust uh, about around, I want to say 2017. Uh, I was fairly into Rust. I thought, you know, I was a little bit sort of far away from kind of systems programming at the time. Uh, I had taken, you know, a very long uh, vacation from this kind of stuff for a, you know a long time and I would characterize characterize myself as a as being interested in rust and you know let's say arguing for it without actually using it and uh, this is actually <laughs> this is the distinct feeling I get from a lot of rust people to be honest um, that they sort of fall into that as well. Um, however, um, the things that actually make me really turned off from Rust, right? Um, the actual concrete things that I would say are my experiences with actually using it in, in, in practice. Um, I remember this was maybe 2018 at some point, somewhere around there. Uh, 2018, early 2019 or something, uh, I built a service for um, basically a proof of concept of a logging service that used Kafka. Um, 
in order to receive messages and then log them and so on. Um, and so I used SERTI because SERTI is basically what everyone else uses for deserialization, serialization, and so on. And uh, immediately when I added SERTI and just one derive, as you do, of course, because it's Rust and you can't actually write manual, like code manually, of course. Um, immediately, my compile time started taking basically two seconds for a project that was minimal. We're talking incredibly small. Uh, it was an awful experience. Um, and I think at that point they had already started caching or whatever. I don't know. It wasn't doing a complete compilation. Uh, as far as I know, this was a normal bog standard VS code setup uh, at the time. I don't think there was anything special about it. And it was just a terrible experience. And it re reminded me a lot of using Haskell, actually, um, where all of these fancy features, you know, code generation inside of the language, macros, whatever it might be, right? Of course, uh, Haskell doesn't actually have macros, but, you know, deriving stuff from your types and all of these things, right? But then you immediately find that your compile times suddenly just drop off a cliff um, or the opposite rather. And, and stuff like this, it, it just, mm, I don't know, is this really the, the thing that we want to focus on? Um, generally speaking, I would say the entire language falls into thinking, I guess, the opposite of what I do. They love abstracting things over and over, like abstracting in many, many layers. Uh, dependencies, as soon as you install one thing, you just get tons of, of dependencies. Like if we, we can click on this, I suppose. This shouldn't have any, ah, apparently this has dependencies. And this has dependencies. Like at some point, where are we, I don't know. The, my experience with Rust is that it is Definitely, it tries to basically be the JavaScript of system system languages, right? Um, it's just not for me. I think it's for people who just think entirely differently. Uh, also, I should note, everyone who somehow thinks that, oh, Rust, Rust is a lot like Haskell, it's just not. I don't know where you're getting this from. Um, whenever someone says that, I instantly am like, you have never used either of these, I guess, to be honest. I, it's just not. I, I don't understand what people are thinking, to be honest. Um, it has very few of uh, Haskell's upsides, to be honest. Um, I don't know. It, it's a, yeah, Rust is not for me. And I think that there are certain things that sort of tend to happen with languages when they become this galactic scale complexity, sort of, right? Because these galactic languages, right? You end, with, you end up with stuff like this. Uh, so pin, um, the uh, pin trait or whatever, pin type or whatever it might be. Um, so at a high level, pin P ensures that the point T of any pointer type P has a stable location in memory, meaning it cannot be moved elsewhere and its memory cannot be deallocated until it gets dropped. This is, you know, if that doesn't make any sense to you, you know, fair enough, I, I will kind of summarize it by giving a little bit of context, right? Rust tries to do a lot, right? Um, it tries to do a lot without talking about it, right? Any value in Rust uh, can be, basically its memory can be moved elsewhere as Rust sees fit, right? Uh, this pin type, basically this pin trait, uh, basically says, no, you shall not. Right, uh, you will not be moved, and so on. The only reason you need this is because the rest of the complexity, right? This is a little bit like how you need some things in C++ because they've added some other thing, and now we need to make up for it somehow, right? And uh, I don't think that this is a great, you know, this type of language, right? It grows these kinds of things over time that are just you have to learn page five over and over again for each feature that you're using, right? C++ is clearly a lot worse at this, right? And by page five, I mean, see page five for how all of these things we're talking about right now can go completely horribly wrong unless you do X and Y, right? And so these types of galactic 
complexity language languages can they kind of grow page fives over time right um, and I think rust is destined to be effectively just another C++ at the end of the day um, I think it will seem ridiculous somehow that people thought it would be better uh, but granted a lot of people love rust so you know to each their own right um, I think rust is just not for me uh, it's for people who don't value clear dependency chains um, or just not using dependencies very much. Um, it's for people who think that writing code is the problem, uh, like a large enough problem to be solving all, all, you know, all day. They want macros, they want uh, decorators everywhere and so on. They would ra rather, rather have basically obfuscated code that sort of when you want to look into it, yeah, you don't mind stepping through eight layers of bullshit in order to get to the thing that actually does something instead of maybe having that stuff, you know, at the top level and so on. Uh, so, yeah, Rust has never really made a lot of sense. And I think that there is a uh, an interesting thing here also, right? Uh, this article uh, written by Zach Overflow, I don't know who that is beyond this article, but um, I think it makes a good point. Um, and I, I, I would say I would kind of downgrade this title to effectively writing unsafe zig, which is basically most of it, right? Writing zig is a lot nicer than writing unsafe rust. So if you find yourself writing unsafe code and so on, which I don't mind, at all. Um, I don't think that's the problem, to be honest. I think that's also a little bit of a red herring, to be honest. Um, writing unsafe code in Odin or Zig is a lot better than writing unsafe Rust, right? So if that's how you prefer to do things and relying on actual knowledge about sort of memory and stuff like this, there is no point in you using Rust, I would say. Uh, but if you know, if you value sort of having this layer on top, yeah, Rust is probably for you, right? And for all of the other reasons, you know, maybe you want to install a bunch of libraries instead of kind of writing stuff yourself and so on. Uh, that's also obviously fine. Uh, it is not for me though. So I, I would say these are the reasons that sort of have led me away from Rust over time. Uh, and again, I was fairly into it at some point, interested certainly wrote a few toy things in it and so on. Didn't really have anything I would want to do in it though. Um, so that's why we kind of ended up not doing anything at the time. And then I just sort of found things that I liked more, obviously. So on to the next one. So for this one, um, I'm not gonna be pointing out a lot of articles uh, necessarily. A lot of, uh, there's no marketing page as far as I know for you know C++. Um, but we're on number three, C++. Um, C++ is, is an ob obvious alternative because one, it does everything that, you know, Odin does, obviously. Um, it allows you to do a lot of stuff yourself. Uh, it allows you to just drop down to C if you want to. You can use any combination of C and C++ that you want, uh, effectively. And so on, right? That's why it's an obvious alternative. It's also extremely popular and so on. And I do want to shout out one channel here. Jason Turner. C++ Weekly with Jason Turner. Good channel. You will find a lot of red in this list if we scroll down. because Jason Turner is an excellent uh, creator um, and uh, he has a lot of interesting videos. In fact, unfortunately though, a lot of the videos are effectively the page five uh, of C++, right? So see page five for how this cool feature that you wanna use, this good feature, how it can completely blow up in your face and so on. With that said, uh, C++ is not without uh, upsides, right? Again, um, so in the kind of disclaimer at the top of this video or whatever at the beginning, 
uh, I did say, I fully expect to write the vast majority of code myself, right? So with that, uh, with that scenario, right, you could actually see that there are, you know, I can pick basically any subset of C++, right, to use. And so with this, this scenario actually is fairly good for C++, right? Um, you could actually see a situation where I could find a subset of C++ that made sense. However, the problem there is, how do I find that subset, <laughs> right? Uh, I don't have currently a subset that I think is, you know, the one, right? Certainly, I don't have one that seems clearer to me to be productive than Odin, right? So from that perspective, C++ kind of, you know, it can't win because of that, right? Um, it is harder to see how I would pick a subset of C++ that made more sense than just continuing to use Odin or switch to Zig, right? Because I don't necessarily want to just say, oh, well, you know, this other, you know, this ecosystem is using C++, right? Uh, you would use C++ if you were using this thing. Yeah, but I don't use those things, right? And I don't have an interest in using most of those things, right? So it is not necessarily the case that any of those arguments make sense, right? Uh, you could also argue, hey, I used to do C++, right? Uh, from 2001 or so uh, until, I don't know, 2010 something, 2011 maybe, uh, I basically did only C++, right? So clearly there's some level of you know, familiarity here. Yeah, mostly though, with C++ that is very close to C, to be honest, right? I would not say that modern C++ makes uh, as much sense to me at all. Um, you know, some of them, some of the things do, but a lot of the things don't. And a lot of the stuff that the language has and so on, even the stuff that I kind of want to use, to be honest, has these page fives, right? or I would have to invest in learning those page fives. You know, let's go to page five to see how lambdas just stop working in some scenario or, you know, stuff like this, right? Let's go to page five to see how, uh, for example, these polymorphic memory resources, uh, i.e. custom allocators and so on, how they don't work uh, if you use them this way or that way and so on, stuff like this, right? So some of those things can, you know, I would say that that would be a problem that I would have to solve if I were to use C++. So that is kind of why I'm not necessarily jumping on C++ as an alternative right now, because I don't see it being better than Odin for me, right? Um, it is, however, the perpetual alternative, alternative, right? C++ will always be there, right? And for that, it sort of just sort of, it will always, in some ways, it will always... Uh, occupy some space in my brain, this language, right? Uh, if nothing else, it's because it formed how I relate to basically code, uh, first of all, right? And also how I view memory and stuff like this. I learned all of that in C++, obviously. So, uh, you know, it will always be there and it will always be an alternative as well. I'm not convinced uh, of you know, C++, you know, the, the decline of C++, to be honest. Um, in fact, I suspect it will outlive Rust, for example, right? Another language on this list, right? So with this said, uh, let's kind of move on to the next one, which will be basically just kind of more the same, but with a little bit more, you know, honestly, a little bit of hand waving, right? So, and this, the, the stuff that I'm gonna say about C, which is the next one, right? Uh, will also in, in large part apply to C++ to be clear, right? So C and C++ have, there's a lot of undefined behavior that no one is doing anything about. Um, and with that, I mean, you can sort of just run into it and you will have to have a great linter or something in order to not, right? Um, Odin and Zig actually make this problem considerably easier to handle because the compiler actually does more for you to 
highlight those types of situations, right? So those languages actually make it a lot harder to have this problem in practice, um, these types of things, right? Um, but undefined behavior is one of those constant things. Uh, I don't know exactly how many documented undefined behaviors there are, but it's, uh, it's an insane amount. And learning a lot of these can, can be very daunting and so on. There's another thing where, of course, I expect to write a lot of the code myself, right? Like I said. Um, yeah, I don't want to stress this point too much because, again, writing the code mostly yourself, you can actually make a library, uh, a set of libraries that actually work together in a very reasonable way. You can have your own string type. And nowadays, I'm a lot more well informed when it comes to how to write my own string type, for example. If I were to do this, right, writing my own slice types, right, and so on. But when I'm saying all of these things, right, it makes it very easy to see that I would effectively be kind of trying to re-implement Odin, right? Um, I would be trying to re-implement most of the stuff that I actually like from Zig and Odin. And uh, at that point, it might seem a little bit pointless, right? But there, is, there are upsides here, right? Uh, C99. Um, Unfortunately, it has really bad support on, on Windows, but um, you can essentially take the route through C++ if you want to do that at that point. You can write C code, but effectively it's sort of in C++ files. is entirely doable, right? Um, C99 on Linux is just fine, right? Um, and so I think that there is, there's room for C, right? Um, there is an alternative kind of, uh, you know, universe, an alternate universe here where I just use C instead. But there are there are a lot of things that are sort of they are they are just wrong in C. Um, it's it's not really defensible in, in, in some ways, right? So the the ease with which you can use slices in Odin actually and just sort of have them be what they need to be. Uh, is amazing when you consider that an array, for example, in, in C just decays to pointers, right, and so on. Uh, there's information that's lost there, right, that we don't need to lose. Uh, this is not a fixable problem. Um, it's a pretty fundamental problem because it just makes it harder to deal with so many scenarios, to be honest. Uh, a lot of them have led to some of the worst uh, remote code execution uh, bugs in history, right? So there's a lot of issues that sort of would be annoying to fix it with C. Um, I'm not saying that they would be everyday things necessarily, right? But again, there's a, a fine line between just making C the thing you want, in my case, and just recreating Odin badly, right? So with that, you know, said, it sort of just makes more sense for me to use Odin, right? Uh, and that is kind of why. But I am very, I am probably more positive than most when it comes to C++ and C and the, for basically using C++ as C, right? Um, so, you know, certainly I would be probably more favorable to C and C++ than Rust for my own things, uh, at the very least, right? So with all of that said, I'm not using C and C++, of course. Um, well, let's go to the next one. So, next language, uh, Dlang. Um, at some point, I don't know exactly when, uh, I was still using C++ at the time, um, I became aware of a language called D. Um, it's not really the same D that we have nowadays, but um, because, well, a lot, lots of stuff has happened, you know, since then. But uh, I've been aware of D for a very, very long time as an alternative to C++. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but it was probably always a better choice than C++, to be honest. Um, you know, back in the day and so on. Um, but there are a few things that kind of make me not as interested in C or D, rather, um, nowadays. And, uh, you know, I think it, it is a very interesting language. It has certain things that I actually like a lot. So if we look at this, for example, they have a better C flag that effectively turns off a lot of the features of D and instead basically gives you a better C. Um, this is incredibly interesting. 
there are lots of things in D that are just better than, than C. Um, one of them being that arrays don't just decay into pointers and so on. Um, it is a lot better in many ways uh, that way. And so one of the things that I actually like a lot when it comes to um, comes to D is uh, UFCS. Let's see. So function declarations, this is not necessarily what we want. Let's see here. We have universal, universal function call syntax delang.org. Let's just do a site here. It is interesting how that is somehow uniform, so uniform, not universal, uniform. Though I'm, okay. Let's open this page again and see if we can, uh, there you go. Let's click on this link. And so here you will find that so here we have just a function uh, prototype or whatever, de declaration, right? Sun on t uh, with second argument int, right? It returns a void, uh, returns nothing, right? So one of the th things you can do here if you have a t, right, like we do in moon, is you can just call t dot sun, right? And the first argument here is always going to be assumed to be the the one that you call the quote unquote method on, right? This basically allows you to have normal functions that you call as methods when you want to, right? And this is incredibly neat, it's, a, it's super nice, right? So for example, here you have a standard in, right? By line is just a function defined for standard in, right? Which takes, it takes two arguments, right? The actual handle and then uh, this keep terminator dot yes here thing. So we can actually get this kind of neat, in some ways, it's almost like pipelining, right? It's just function chaining, right? And we don't need to have these be defined specifically in some kind of class or anything interesting like this, right? We simply use them as functions on things, but we call them with method syntax, right? So you can see here, this is the same as this mess down here, right? So this is very nice. It actually helps a lot, to be honest, right? Um, there are some downsides here that are fairly obvious. It is very hard here to return errors and deal with them, right? Unless you have, unless you use exceptions, right? That is a natural downside of this, right? You will not have error handling that is value-based by doing stuff like this necessarily, right? You would have to be, in some ways, you have to refrain from using this a lot because you want to handle errors, right? If you have value, value based errors, right? So it is awkward if you value other things sometimes, right? There's also a massive problem that sort of looms everywhere in D where there is so much in D. It has had so many years to just accumulate features and so on. And it can be just a bit too large. It is a lot like C++ in this uh, respect. I would say that generally speaking, most of the features in D are more well thought out still than in C++ maybe, right? But they're all, not always more well, you know, better implemented to be clear though. Uh, the GC that comes with D is not particularly good, right? So if you were to end up using that, uh, and, and by the way, that, that is something that D users have said, so it's not some, not me, uh, and so on. And it has certain things that I think are, you know, it shares certain miss features that uh, the C++ has uh, and so on that I don't actually enjoy or think are good, right? Um, one of them is uh, resource acquisition is initialization, automatic destructors. Th something falls out of scope, and then magic happens. Some shit 
some stuff runs um, when that happens, right? Um, I think that's just not necessarily what I want, right? And of course, I could just decide to not use it, right? But if I use things from the standard library, do I know everything there, right? The standard library is still something I want to depend on when it comes to languages. I think that's fair game, right? Because the standard library comes with the language. It's not something you have to install, right? So that is a little bit awkward. Wouldn't necessarily, necessarily want to be in this situation, right? Also, how much of the standard library am I actually turning off when I use better C? No garbage collection, right? Nowadays, it's probably a little bit better. But at some point, you turned off large bits of the standard library because they were just kind of allocating with GC, right? So it's an awkward language in that respect sometimes. But I do think if you were to invest yourself in D, right, you could build something that was absolutely great. Um, I believe in it from that point of view. Right. So D has historically been an alter alternative, right? But it's not one that wins out. That is basically it, right? A few languages would have to not exist, and then I would use D, basically. And I think that's kind of where I would place it. All right. So next alternative, uh, Golang. Uh, this might not seem like an obvious alternative. It is, of course, a lot later on the list, like uh, uh, position five, right? And the reason I'm mentioning Go uh, here is because I do. there are certain things that I do appreciate a lot about Go, uh, about the design of Go. Um, I, of course, have spent a lot of my time learning these quote-unquote galactic level complexity languages and so on. Um, and I think Go is a breath of fresh air, right? Um, not only because, oh, the language is so simple, blah, blah, blah. Um, code in Go tends to do, just do the thing. Right. Um, it is a lot less focused on sort of abstracting, abstracting, abstracting things and so on. Uh, you have much more focus also on saying, you know, you can do with the standard library. Right. There are some things also that they are adding that I think are very relevant to to me. Right. Um, or have added. I haven't tried them yet and I have had no real reason to yet necessarily. Right. So those would be arenas and so on, which gives us some level of control of, you know, some kind of scope where we can actually say, you know, we know we allocate the memory here and then we can we can free all of that memory ourselves at some point and so on. And so I think Go is an, is an alternative uh, because it also covers a lot of other stuff, right? Of course, I uh, traditionally have built backend services, right? Um, my favorite languages for doing that currently are Erlang and Elixir, right? Um, but, but I think that you could probably actually build something that makes more sense uh, than those languages in Golang. Uh, more sense from a source perspective, meaning it is easier to actually see what's going on. Uh, the code is more malleable. Uh, it is easier to change, spot bugs in, and so on. Uh, there are some problems with Go. I, I would, I think I would want some kind of tagged union, probably, that is actually you know supported like we have in Odin, of course, um, where you don't have to manage the tags yourselves uh, and so on. With that said, I think you can actually use interfaces for some of those use cases, and it actually makes sense. Um, but yeah, I like Go. Uh, I like that it's a language you can learn in a weekend, basically, uh, and actually get going with. Uh, certainly, if you are, you have learned uh, one or two languages before, uh, Go is not a challenge to, to learn. It is fairly straightforward. And it stops before you kind of sigh in desperation, let's say. Uh, it stops well before that point, and you kind of feel like, hey, I can just sort of go be productive. Um, it... It has that feeling that I got when I used Zig for the first time, basically. Uh, the first weekend I used Zig, I actually felt like I was being productive, right? This is a very rare, rare thing, right? Um, so yeah, I like Golang as an alternative. Do I think that it's as easy to actually make something that runs efficiently and so on in, in Go? No. Um, 
I have not personally felt that I have had as much control over things necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily know. I can't confidently say, oh, this code here doesn't allocate, for example, in Go. Um, this may or may not be a me problem, uh, but it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, what I'm saying is I wouldn't be as confident in Golang code as I am, you know, in something else. But importantly, I would say Golang does not lose out here because, oh, there's this thing I just hate or whatever. Um, it's more like, I do think that Zig, Odin, etc. Um, give you just more control, more clear control. With that said, Odin shares a lot of this kind of, hey, this is just simple, straightforward code. It doesn't try to be a lot. It doesn't try to be some fancy, you know, language from the future necessarily. It's just trying to make the better, the, the now better, right? It's trying to do the current things we do really well, right? And uh, it has that unapologetically procedural language style, right? We just want to write procedural code, right? Do thing, do other thing, etc. Because that is actually kind of what makes sense in the long run, right? Uh, so that's what I would say about Golang. Uh, I like it a lot. I have used it for CLI stuff. I have used it for some uh, backend stuff and so on. And I like it for those things. But for the things that we're talking about in this particular video and so on, and for what you would use Odin for, it's probably not going to be your choice, right? But it is, however, a good choice. And if anyone is interested in kind of learning programming and so on, I think Golang would be a good choice as well. So yeah, on to the next one. All right, number six, um, Nim. At some point, I, I thought, here, my first view of Nim was, oh, this is basically just sort of a, a lower level Python, right? Sort of, ish. It has some, you know, it has that kind of feeling, right? And there are certain things that I do think are kind of interesting about Nim. Um, I do think that it's, it's certainly a fairly, like on the surface, it looks readable, this language, right? But there are a few things that I have sort of learned while while trying to learn Nim uh, and so on, trying to get into it, uh, I learned that I do not find this readable at all in practice, this language. It is essentially unreadable in actual code bases for a few reasons. Um, and so if we were to, actually, we can, we can use this as an example. Uh, Nim has overloading, function overloading. Right. It also has uniform uh, function call syntax that we saw in DLang, which is interesting, right? That's cool, right? Uh, but one of the things that Nim does is it absolutely does not at all, and the ecosystem does not do this, they do not do specific imports. They also don't do qualified imports. So when you import macros, you're getting everything, right? When you import string utils here, you get everything. Same with string format here, right? These, these functions that you're getting, you're getting the whole thing, right? And if one of those happened to be an overload for something you're doing, you will just get that overload or whatever, right? It's an incredibly messy language, right? On top of that, the templates that they write, the macros and so on, do not seem to have concept of, any concept of hygiene and so on in practice. And so on. So, for example, one of the things, one of the libraries that I was looking into at some point uh, was called uh, uh, Nim Stew result. Uh, it's the result type and so on. And I found out that one of the macros or several of the macros in this library, and most of it was macros, by the way, which is not super great, um, was basically referring to things that weren't even in scope, right? A macro can effectively just add random code into the call site in Nim. They have no concept of, hey, should the compiler see that this is in scope or whatever it might be? Um, it is just sort of Rambo, right? And I find that this is, this is not for me, right? 
we talked about before, I think that there are certain languages that focus on the wrong thing, right? Nim is very much focusing on the wrong things. And there are two things that kind of, I think, illustrate this, right? You might not agree, but I think illustrate this. One, macros are super important in Nim. They overuse them, they use them all the time, right? This basically points to, well, the problem is obviously writing code. Writing code is the problem. I don't agree. Um, I think debugging code is the problem. Understanding code is the problem. Uh, having everything be over abstracted is the problem, right? Because those things actually, when I'm sitting down and trying to fix something, at the end of the day, all those things are making it harder to actually fix the problem, right? The problem is simply, I don't understand what this is doing and how is that possible uh, I've been working on this code base for half a year, right? That's the, the problem in some sense. Um, and I think that certain languages have a very easy time ending up in that position. I would say Nim seems to me like a prime example of this, right? Um, so number one is it overfocuses on metaprogramming and abstracting the writing of code and so on and so forth, right? That's number one. Uh, number two is there is absolutely zero way to actually control allocation in this language. They don't have custom allocators. It is effectively really not competing with any of the languages that I thought it was competing with. Nim is not competing with D, C, C++, uh, Rust, uh, Zig, Odin, right? I do think even Rust has a better chance at sort of being straightforward when it comes to uh, allocation and so on. Though it should be mentioned, Rust, of course, has kind of shit support for custom allocators, right? They also don't really focus on the right things, right? But I think Nim is perhaps even worse, right? So from that perspective, Nim has not really been the alternative for me, right? I think it focuses on the wrong things. It has added features also that simply no one, I think, in the universe asked for, right? And it seems in some ways like a research vehicle for the creator of Nim more than anything, right? So instead of kind of fixing these types of things where, well, I would like custom allocators, this seems pretty basic for a lower level language. It is instead the case that Nim is just really not a lower level language, really, right? Uh, it just is not appropriate for the same use cases. Uh, if you wanted to kind of optimize stuff in Nim, you would have to essentially indirectly try to do those things, right? Talking about allocation and stuff like this, instead of directly talking about them and have some semblance of control and order, right? Um, so Nim, unfortunately, was a major disappointment to me uh, when I actually looked into it. Uh, it really didn't fit at all what I thought Nim was supposed to be, to be honest. Uh, it is, however, probably an interesting language for someone who might want an alternative to something like OCaml uh, or Haskell maybe because I don't think it can compete any in any way with uh, lower level languages really but yeah so that's Nim all right so we're up to seven at this point uh, this is the website for Crystal um, a language heavily inspired by Ruby um, and so we can look at kind of what Crystal looks like. Um, people who know Ruby, I, I'm not necessarily a Ruby person, uh, but I can see that this is heavily inspired by Ruby uh, and so on. They will recognize this as being, you know, you can see here, uh, it's heavily inspired by Ruby, so it feels natural to read and easy to write, blah, blah, blah. I obviously, I don't really agree. I think Ruby syntax is not at all somehow more, in, you know, uh, simpler or anything <laughs> than most others. I, I think that's mostly something that they have sort of constructed in their head, if I'm being honest. But Crystal is interesting, um, to be clear. Uh, I think everything else is much more interesting about Crystal than the supposedly good syntax. Um, but uh, so if we look, for example, here, by the way, it has macros, which, yeah, again, we talked about this in the previous sections. I don't think that this is necessarily the, the place where you should uh, focus your energy. Uh, I think it's mostly pointless. Uh, but you can see here that it has a much stronger kind of, of course, it's a typed language. Um, 
strongly statically typed. Um, and so it has certain views on things like this, non-reference text. All types are non-nillable in crystal and nillable variables are represented as a union between the type and nil, right? So we get this kind of uh, straightforward, like, hey, this should be uh, nullable and this should not, right? Uh, if you don't say that it is, it won't be, and so on. And Crystal is interesting in many ways. It actually has uh, an OOP kind of lean, let's say. So, but it also has this kind of... Uh, let's see. So here you can put types here, but the inference is actually such that you can uh, you can get away in some respects with uh, not having these types and so on, as far as I understand. Um, and you can define, for example, here, these methods can be just overloaded uh, and so on, if you want. Um, I think Crystal is an interesting language. There were a few things though. Uh, first of all, this, kind of OOP stuff uh, that they do actually do, as far as I know, uh, is not interesting to me. Um, I don't think object-oriented programming is uh, the way things should be done uh, in pretty much any scenario. I don't think it's useful, necessarily. Uh, certainly not this whole, like, oh, we have classes and all of those things, necessarily. Right? Um, but uh, one of the key things actually that made me not uh, use Crystal at some point was uh, they took this unfortunate position that somehow Windows was not something you needed to support. And I have no idea if this is fixed nowadays, um, but it was an interesting kind of choice, right? Because Ruby made this choice at some point uh, because Ruby of course was not necessarily relevant on a Windows machine uh, always, right? But Crystal, is a little bit more towards the native side of things. And when a native language does not support Windows, um, you should probably not invest in that language, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, I don't use Windows, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily trust uh, an ecosystem that doesn't support Windows when it comes to native languages. It is fairly, they have no interest in actually doing real things, um, I would say. Um, and so this kind of turned me off of Crystal. Um, on top of that, while I do think a lot of the stuff that they're doing is interesting, they actually have fairly, like you can actually kind of write Ruby-ish code and get something kind of natively uh, fairly efficient and so on. Uh, those things are interesting and impressive, but just not super relevant for me at all, right? So it hasn't really worked out to the point where I, I feel like I, this is the language for me. But it was at some point kind of part of the discussion, right? I had a few languages that I was looking at when I was actually getting into Zig that kind of, you know, they fit somewhere in the picture. Crystal was one of them. It sort of got removed at some point. That's why it's fairly low on this list, right? We're on number seven here, of course. So uh, that's Crystal. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So. Uh, we're now on number nine. Of course, I was wrong when I said Crystal was seven. It's actually eight. Uh, doesn't really matter. You're probably watching these in order. It doesn't matter. Uh, so, number nine is ATS. Um, ATS is... This one probably comes a little bit from left field. Uh, we're fairly low on the, the actual you know, list here. I will say this. Uh, ATS was actually the one of the languages that popped up in my head when I was like, I want to do lower level coding, but I want something better, right? And keep in mind when I show, when I show these examples or whatever, right? Keep in mind that these are gonna be largely unfamiliar. They're gonna do things that we are not used to doing and so on, right? ATS is, I think, if you could actually kind of educate yourself and educate your colleagues, I think ATS would actually be a reasonable choice 
if we wanted to produce safe C code, basically. Right. So let's look very briefly at what ATS actually kind of looks like and and, uh, you know, here you can see uh, Hello World. So far, so good, right? Uh, here we have a function that uh, copies from some kind of file to so an input to an output. Both of these are file ref and so on. We can see here val c is file ref get g get c with your our input and so on. And then we define what uh, in if right okay we define a binding c right and then a context where that binding is used right if c is greater than zero then we say basically execute some kind of effect here that's what this means basically everything has return value in ats much like ocaml uh, and so this here is going to be the return value of something that does not return anything so it's the void return value basically um, then we have this file ref put C, right? Because we did get C here, uh, out and then C. Uh, in F copy, input to output, and so on. This might look a little bit strange uh, already, and certainly it probably should. Right? ATS does not necessarily look like uh, most of the things that we have seen before, uh, and it will only look stranger and stranger the more we look at it, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, <laughs> this this example, yeah, I don't know. It's it's very hard to kind of uh, it's it's kind of hard to get into this when you can also tell that this is in some ways written by someone who does not necessarily give a shit, uh, hundred percent, right? Uh, but one of the things that I actually want to show about it is that I think is the most interesting thing and why I actually think that this could actually be relevant. Um, in the long run is that ATS has, it is effectively, uh, it's a language based on proofs. So a function can basically return a proof that we need in order to discharge something, right? And so I want to go through basically what is happening here uh, one by one, not because I know it, but because they actually have written out what is happening here, right? So this function here, uh, string to base 64 is effectively what you think it should be right uh, string to base 64 right so here first we get the string length of s our input argument right uh, compute the length of the destination string as d len right so the size of uh, what we are going to be outputting effectively right and here we have an allocation here right malloc gc note here that you don't need to necessarily nothing needs to be gc'd in uh, in ats at all it's pro probably one of the few languages that actually can give you c style malloc basically while also being 100 percent safe and this here is interesting uh because the pf variables here that are returned are actually proofs right so PF bytes is a proof that we have dlen plus one bytes allocated as a at a specific memory address, right? This one, right? This is very interesting. PFGC is a proof variable that is used to ensure we free the memory later. So this means basically, as long as PFGC is alive, let's say, it means that would be if, if a function exits with pfgc still alive that means we have a memory leak and it will not compile this is incredibly interesting right it gives us basically much stronger guarantees than rust for example here we actually have a variable we can pass this around we can we can pass this from this function and whoever called the function needs to deal with it right this is uh, very interesting right and something like this that is not necessarily ATS could be the future right it could be a version of Odin 
where we actually have to pass these proofs or something, right? That could be actually very use useful. Certainly much more useful in practice than, than Rust, for example. Right? Rust has a baby version, effectively, of some of these things. And these proofs can be about all kinds of stuff, of course. Right? They are these values at compile time that we have to either take care of, we have to do something with. right? And this is very interesting. I think this kind of stuff is what makes ATS interesting. And so that's kind of why this was on, effectively, my radar at some point uh, in this conversation. However, ATS is incredibly hard to learn. It's very hard to get into. If you want an example of this, you can look up a video called A Taze of uh, ATS. This is not a typo. Uh, so Aditya Siram, Deech, made this video or made this talk about ATS. I highly recommend this talk. Um, it is very interesting. He goes over some of these examples because he painstakingly, painstakingly, painstakingly went through, tried to understand this stuff, and distilled it into something that is interesting, right? And I think ATS is very interesting. It points in a direction that I think we would want to go, maybe, right? A much more generally useful direction than something like Rust, for example. Rust is very limited, right? But it's not limited in the in a way where it actually becomes much better, to be honest, right? And so I think ATS, you know, the next or next next version of ATS might be something that I, I'm like, yes, this could be the one, you know. This makes perfect sense. So that's kind of where I've left ATS right now. I probably won't learn ATS. I probably won't actually get into it that much. But I think it is a good direction to go in. And I think it is a good direction to explore more than anything. So yeah, on to the next one. The last one, in fact. All right, so round number 10. Uh, this last one was a bit of a late, uh, late comer. I don't know exactly when it was made. I was certainly not aware of it until, you know, fairly late at least, uh, after I was, so after I had sort of, I had gone as deep as I would basically in Zig, for example, um, I became aware of Cake Lisp. Um, and Cake Lisp, if, if I had to summarize it, it is basically a Lisp that says, we will not have GC, uh, we will have metaprogramming and so on. Uh, but we will be exceedingly towards the simpler side of things, and we need great interop with C and C++. Some of these are great. Some of these, are, obviously, you know my opinion on, on metaprogramming at this point. Um, but there's something very interesting about Cake Lisp. I do like it a lot. Um, and there is, there is sort of a, a version of the future where I'm just sitting in some kind of cabin somewhere, writing cake lisp all day every day and just sort of making games or something um that is not the future we live, we live in right now but it is an interesting language right uh, it has a very interesting view of things like this right so you can for example say hey c import you know uh c import with decals uh, this stuff right that is this is neat I think that this is a, a, a good idea, right? Um, here you have basically what the types correspond to in the different languages. I like Lisp, by the way. I definitely think Lisp, I'm probably much more positive about Lisp than most people. Um, and uh, I think Lisp syntax is probably the best syntax, um, generally speaking. Um, that doesn't mean I think you know everything needs to have it. But I think if you look at it, generally speaking, yeah, Lisp syntax is really the one that makes the most sense uh, because it is almost no syntax, uh, in fact. And there's no ambiguity. Everything is very straightforward with Lisp syntax to me. And uh, you can kind of write normal, simple, simple, straightforward code in Cake, uh, Cake Lisp. And for that, I, I like it. I, I think it is... I actually think 
there are lots of languages on this list that I would use, I would use later than I would use cake, right? But it's more like this sort of showed up fairly late for me, right? Uh, and I, I'll be honest, I do not trust that it would be a good experience for editing. Uh, I don't think I would have the tools that I want. I would probably have to make an LSP thing for it or something, maybe, and so on. And that's, that's unfortunate, right? Uh, but I do think that, yeah, I like this a lot. I think this is a, a good idea. Uh, Again, I'm not much for macros uh, in practice, obviously. Um, I probably wouldn't use them very much. It depends a little bit, right? Um, maybe I would just get into it. Maybe I would just sort of, again, I'm sitting out in a cabin, writing code for myself, all of those <laughs> things, like everything comes together. I'm, I'm just right, making this insane tower of weird lisp native code, right? Uh, could be interesting honestly right i think this the the coming together of c and c plus plus and lisp is probably one of the most potent mixes of things you could do right um and maybe maybe that's where sort of this is so much power that you can't really not respect it right it is just so big all of this stuff, right? It's not just some weak language trying to be, you know, oh yeah, we have macros, it's so powerful. This is like, no, no, we took some of the most, some of the biggest massive things and just pushed them together and we got this massive beast out of it, right? That you can then build even more shit on top of. Uh, I think Cake Lisp is very interesting. I would honestly, I would hope that someone checks it out and maybe tells me about it, to be honest. I think uh, it's definitely an interesting thing that I would definitely, I could see myself using this, you know, I could definitely see myself using this for sure. Notably here, tools integration, nothing about, of course, you know, language servers or anything interesting like this, right? So again, you would probably, you would probably have to build this yourself, right? Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this. I think it's a, it's potentially a, a very, uh, it's potentially a very productive language when you're just sitting down and you're doing stuff uh, your, yourself, right? So yeah, um, that's all of the languages on the list. Uh, if you feel like something was left out or whatever, yeah, it was uh, very likely. Uh, lots of the criticisms I have for some of the languages were left out. Certainly a lot of positives were left out for a lot of the stuff. Some of them I know about, some of them I won't know about and so on. Uh, this list has been effectively just sort of my view on things, of course. Um, it is not a definitive, you know, resource for uh, learning about these languages, uh, learning what they're good for and so on. And remember that your mileage may vary, right? Your opinion on stuff is not my opinion on stuff. And so when what it all actually comes down to, right, is all of the languages that I've mentioned, even some of the ones I've been the most negative about, I would recommend trying them out, right? Uh, I would recommend trying other languages out because at the, at the core of it, right, something may speak to you, right? Uh, and some guy on the internet, their opinion on things should not matter at that point, right? Certainly, I do not go on the internet and sort of find that someone says, you know, I don't believe in Odin. I think it will probably be shut down in two years or whatever, or forgotten, or it will never have users and so on. I don't go there and say, you know what? I'm going to take all of that to heart and sort of leave a thing that I think, you know, makes me happy and gels with my view on things. No, of course I won't, right? Because the actual important bit is that I like it, I can make something good out of it. You know, 
And so if you, for example, feel like Rust is the best thing since sliced bread, um, I would urge you then to say, you know, it doesn't matter what anyone out on the internet says. Uh, and I would also kind of stretch this a little bit further. Consider this, right? When people talk about community and so on, what is that actually worth, right? To me, it's worth nothing. Uh, I have found them when people talk about the community and so on, that is effectively uh, one of the least relevant things to me, I would say. Um, I have never found community to necessarily be a good thing. Um, lots of the communities that I actually do enjoy or rather think are good aren't so much communities as they are here's everyone who likes this thing and there are many sub communities let's say right so you might have irc channels you might have a discord for something uh, you might have a mailing list and so on very rarely do i find when something has a bunch of official channels for example oh this has its own discord uh, it has its own forum and so on. What I usually find in those cases is the community is very insular. Uh, it is very cult-like in its behavior and so on. And I would say explicitly, this is one of the feelings that I certainly have about Elixir. Uh, I don't think, I mean, if I could, I would just remove the community entirely. I would basically say, let's get rid of all of the official channels here and just sort of start over let people build communities that are not elixir forum for example uh it usually breeds mostly ignorance and uh, mostly echo chamber stuff right so you find people who are basically constantly circle jerking about the language uh constantly sort of looking for in some ways to kind of build up propaganda for themselves right um, they're looking to be convinced by everyone on the forum all the time about the excellence of the tool that we all have cho chosen to, you know, use and so on. Um, and so I would stretch this, you know, guy on the internet way thing a little bit further. Uh, if you currently are, you are super excited about something, right? But you find yourself just sort of being part of a community and you're not actually doing anything. Stop. And just sort of start doing stuff instead. Consider that maybe the reason you're not doing anything currently is because the thing you're interested in and think is so good is really not that good for you, right? Consider just sort of switching to something that is immediately a little bit more useful, right, to you. Uh, or get off your ass and just sort of start doing stuff, right? Don't talk about how good this thing is uh, and just do that all day with foreign people just start doing stuff right uh, because you're probably not currently being served by this community as much as you might think right so stop talking start doing uh, if you can't do with your chosen sort of language uh, currently consider choosing another one where doing stuff just sort of comes naturally so yeah, that's the end of the list. Uh, lots of languages. Um, in the comments, please uh, you know share languages that you've evaluated for this purpose. Why didn't you choose them? Um, what was it that stopped you? And so on. Um, what are your views on the criteria that we used here? Right. Um, but yeah, have a nice day and ciao.